We're going to move to our last panel of the day. Uh, we'll ask that uh, panel to come up now. And uh, the title of this one is, Can Trade Continue to Drive Growth in the Americas? I guess there are some assumptions in that. But um, with that, uh, we're going to welcome uh, Doug Brunke to uh, the panel. Please come on up, Doug. So uh, let me just introduce Doug to you. Those of you who don't know Doug, uh, Doug is, uh, his bio is in your uh, booklet, but uh, he, uh, I met him in a, uh, a trade mission from Thailand uh, back in uh, Tempe uh, two, two or three months ago and learned a little bit about his organization, Growth Nation, and the GIC is all about collaborating and we are so appreciative of collaborating with uh, Doug and Growth Nation on this. And I'll turn it over to you, Doug, to do the introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And it looks like we have the diehards left. <laughs> Did Melissa also leave? Yeah, you, can make, you may applaud yourself. She'll be right back. So you may applaud yourself for sticking around. Congratulations. Hugh and Sapna, thank you, C congratulations. Um, I um, am really honored, uh, thank you very much, Peter, and thank you to you and your organization for being asked to, to work with such a distinguished Wells Fargo team that uh, we have here on my right, your, your left. Uh, these are really uh, amazing folks, and you can see from their bios in, in the book uh, that their expertise spans uh, financial areas uh, all around the world, particularly in our, in our hemisphere, but really all around the world. So I'm really pleased to participate and I'm very anxious to learn more about what each of you has to say. Undoubtedly, they'll be framing it in terms of Arizona, uh, because the question that we're asked to, to answer, can trade continue to drive growth in the Americas, it's really not so much a question of can it, it must. You know, we, you know, it will, right? And it's only maybe a question of degree in terms of what we're able to do. I, I've been lucky to have lived in various places, including the Philadelphia area twice as part of the DuPont Company in Wilmington, Delaware, but living in Pennsylvania. So I'm very familiar with that area and its economic development. But there was a period of four uh, assignments I had that I think makes me ask the question about Arizona about where we're headed. We will grow. The question is, how will we grow? So, for instance, I lived in Japan the late 80s, early 90s. And those of you who are old enough to remember, there was a book called The Japan That Can Say No. And in, at one point during that period of time, if you plotted out the GDP of Japan, it crossed over the US in about 10 years. They would actually have a higher GDP than the US. And, that was kind of the mentality. Well, you know, we know what the reality was. Uh, Japan went through a stagnation period for quite a long time. So that's an example of a region that had grand plans, looked fantastic, and it didn't quite work out as they had planned. Um, I then uh, left there for Detroit. And that was in the mid-90s and got my MBA from Michigan State. Anybody from Michigan State? Uh, and they had a mayor named Dennis Archer. And he said, hey, we need to diversify away from automotive, even though that was a really high period of time. And he had all sorts of grand plans. And lo and behold, I left for Singapore, and he left office, and Kwame Kirkpatrick took over, and we all know what happened to Detroit. So there, again, very promising, didn't work, quite work out. Then went to Salt Lake City. And after, well, actually went to Singapore, and Singapore, as we know, has worked out very well. And then to Salt Lake City. And Salt Lake City during the Olympics, and prior to it, was somewhat like Arizona is today. Lots of promise, and they used the Olympics to leverage. And so, lo and behold, what's happened in Salt Lake? They have 30% more exports than we have than Phoenix, and one-fourth the population. So they have done a tremendous job from an international perspective in doing the right things. And so I would ask then, wither Arizona, and hopefully you guys, you know, in terms of your, your expertise, would, would love to hear kind of where we're headed and some of those challenges. And so 
Our first speaker is an extraordinary man, Eugenio Aleman, uh, Dr. Aleman. Is it okay if I call you Eugenio? Uh, he will kick off our presentation today, and as you can tell from his bio, his background, interestingly, both Arizona and Texas, uh, should give us hopefully some perspective since they <laughs> tend to be somewhat more successful than us also as a state. Be very interesting to, to hear from you regarding how we're going to be doing versus them. So could you begin and begin to answer the question for us, can we grow and will we grow and how much? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I didn't prepare all of that Arizona, but um, you can ask questions. I might be able to answer some. Uh, so my, my topic is uh, trade in the Americas. And you know, when I started preparing my, my views or trying to figure out the data, I had some kind of a mental preconcept of what the last 20 years have been for trading the Americas. And I thought that it was, especially during the last 14 years, what, that trade was driven only by commodity prices and, and just by prices rather than quantities. To my great surprise, uh, it, it, it is actually both price and quantity. And there's an extremely uh, uh, important expansion of trade that has occurred in the Americas, or at least not in the Americas or between the Americas, but by American countries uh, during the last 20 years. And some of these uh, graphs are kind of noisy, uh, but what I have here is US and Canada uh, exports, so export real export contribution to GDP growth. Uh, so this is exports, the black lines are exports contribution to GDP growth. Very, very small in the US because US is a very uh, closed economy. And the bluish, uh, clear bluish line is the contribution of net exports. So if, if imports, real imports are larger or higher than real exports contribution, then net exports is negative. So we are subtracting from GDP growth. Uh, and I know that is a kind of a very, very um, uh, noisy pictures, but it gives you an idea that about, on average, export contribution to growth in the US is about 0.3% uh, per year, while in Canada it's been one to one and a half percent, or one percent, with the exception of the last several years, which I mean, especially starting in the 2000, and, and I'll show you why. I mean, I don't know why, but the, that trend uh, closer. These are nominal exports growth. Uh, also for the US and the ex, uh, Western Hemisphere, uh, two selected countries, I and mean, then we have uh, US to Western Hemisphere, US to Brazil, US to Mexico, to Chile, and to Argentina, just to mention some. And I just noticed today that these numbers do, do not correspond to this one. So there's a data point missing here in my, at the end of my graph. So, but this is, I think, that the only mistake that I have. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, but if you can see in nominal terms, uh, the US has, be, has uh, had a tremendous uh, uh, export performance in nominal terms uh, to the Western Hemisphere and to some of these selected Latin American countries. Uh, in Western Hemisphere to the same countries, very, very strong also. But what I was surprised, as I told you before, is that it is not only nominal exports uh, that have been very, very strong in these last 20 years, but real exports. In the US, real exports went to from approximately $0.6 trillion back in 1990 to about a little bit more than $2 trillion uh, in goods and services exported uh, during this 20 year period, which I think that is very, a very, very good performance in, in real terms. So this is actual goods and services being exported. What I was surprised was that 
the only country that hasn't benefited from real export growth is Canada. Uh, so I don't know uh, the, uh, the uh, person from Canada, the uh, diplomat from Canada is not here probably, but Canada's real export has been stagnant uh, during the last at least 10 years, uh, 14 years actually. They grew a lot during the 1990s and in the in 2000s they started to slow down and then they, they, they are still very, very weak. Uh, so even though these are not exports only within NAFTA, it seems that Canada hasn't been able to benefit as much as Mexico, and I'll show you Mexico later on. Uh, so this is Mexico, the same concepts, uh, export contribution to growth and net export contribution to growth. Uh, Mexico has an issue, they, they don't produce almost any input, so they have to increase, import whatever they export. Uh, so that is a, an issue that they have. But you can see that real export growth has been very, very strong. Uh, and contribution of exports, at least net exports, which is exports minus imports, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been negative. Uh, because they need to import a lot of inputs uh, in order to be able to produce. Uh, but, I mean, in relative terms, or if you take only exports, it, it's contributed a lot to growth in GDP. Uh, nominal exports have skyrockets, uh, with the exception, of course, of the 2000 uh, recession, of course, the um, tequila effect, and the 2008 recession, but other than that, nominal exports have boomed from about three uh, billion dollars to almost 35 billion dollars during the last 20 years. So, uh, very, very strong performance of, of exports. And if you look again at real exports from Mexico, uh, also from almost 1.2 trillion dollars, uh, trillion Mexican pesos. Uh, to almost four and a half trillion Mexican pesos in real terms. So very, very strong uh, across the board growth rate uh, of trade, a uh, real trade in Mexico also. Uh, this is Brazil, very similar to the Mexico situation. Very, very strong growth in exports during the last 20 years and of course, it, Mexico, Brazil has a, a very similar problem that, that Mexico has. It has to import almost everything in order to produce. So that's why the net exports uh, are on average negative, but very, very strong performance by the export sector. In nominal terms, very, very strong also. 3%, uh, $3 billion back in 1990, $3.5 billion. Today is about $24 billion in nominal uh, exports by uh, Brazil. And if you look at trade, real trade, real exports and services trade, uh, also uh, from 10, 11 trillion dollars, billion dollars in reais uh, back in 1995 to today's almost 35 trillion reais, uh, which is an, an extremely important increase in real exports for Brazil. So overall, almost all of Latin American countries, at least the largest ones, which is what I look at, have performed extremely well uh, during the last several years. Even Argentina, I mean, we, we hit Argentina very hard today, and I agree with Helen. Uh, actually, I am a little bit more negative than her on Argentina. Uh, and probably the reason is because I am from there, so I know how bad we are. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we can do things really bad. Uh, uh, so, our, even Argentina had a very, very strong growth uh, in exports, and you can see those numbers there. Uh, in billions of dollars, one billion in 1992, almost uh, eight billion dollars today. Very, very strong growth. And even in real terms, very, very strong growth. Uh, these are probably all soybeans uh, going to China, but uh, very, very strong growth. You know that Argentina has a serious problem. 
Uh, they don't consume soybeans. If the Chinese don't buy soybeans, they are dead on arrival. They cannot, they don't eat soybeans. I, actually, I had a, I had a, 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 cousin, a cousin that called me once and said, can you bring me soy, soybeans, uh, beans? Uh, uh, I said, why? Well, because my daughter has a problem in her eyes and she needs to eat beans, soybeans. I said, but uh, Argentina is one of the top exports, producers and exporters of soybeans. Yes, but we don't sell that here. So I had to bring her, uh, him like five packages of, of beans, which I went to Trader Joe and, and bought, and bought uh, some soybeans and I took it to him. And every time that I go back, he says, can you bring me more? Because I cannot find it here. So uh, they have a serious problem uh, with uh, exports, uh, but, but, but exports have boom and have helped uh, the administration lately in financing whatever they are doing there. Anyway, uh, Chile, I think that Chile is the most uh, consistent country in Latin America. Uh, probably it's because of their German uh, heritage uh, and very strong contribution of uh, exports to growth, very strong, strong performance in exports, and even uh, better, of course, uh, uh, performance of uh, nominal exports from about $1.5 billion to uh, 7 or $8 billion. This is mostly copper and copper prices, but in quantity terms, it's very, very strong performance from two uh, billion, two and a half billion pesos to almost 10 and a half billion pesos over, over the last 20 years. And my point here is, I mean, trade has been a, an important component of growth in, in the Americas, especially in the Latin American countries and even in the US. And we expect it to continue to be uh, a, a strong driver of growth uh, during the next several years, especially because as the Federal Reserve ta continues to taper and starts to increase interest rates, these currencies are going to continue to remain under pressure and they are probably going to gain some competitiveness through devaluations and depreciation and they are going to be able to continue to expand trade uh, uh, as it has been happening during the last uh, 20 years. Uh, Peru is a very, very similar that, and as Chile, uh, with Peru real exports booming from two billion dollars uh, pesos, uh, um, two billion pesos uh, or soles, are actually in real terms, to uh, fifth, I mean, 11 billion soles. Very, very strong performance in exports. So. That is my, my part of the presentation. Uh, I, we think that exports will continue to in, improve over the years. Uh, I think that these countries have been able to develop these export markets and export capacities, and they are going to be able to continue to grow, grow through exports. Uh, even if, if they don't bring lots of money as they used to because commodity prices are probably going to slow down, uh, they have the capacity to continue to, to grow exports over the years. And I will allow my colleague to continue with the presentation. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Ana uh, Ramirez. She's a Trade Solutions Relationship Manager for Wells Fargo International Trade Services, and she's uh, going to give her expertise and share her expertise in that area and fortunately you know that's going to bring some of the business connectivity that she's involved with on a day-to-day -day basis and hopefully you'll find that uh, since many of you left are in business you I think you'll find that very useful so Anna could you share your expertise please absolutely thank you Doc so I'm going to make mine very very brief and um, and we, we know that it's the end of the day for all of us, so let's, let's make this short. Um, I am not an economist. Um, I am a trade finance uh, solutions or consultant or 
a trusted advisor, and I work with, uh, with companies basically that are import and or exporting. And I am part of the International Trade Services Division of Wells Fargo. Uh, with a very uh, strong economic outlook in the Americas, our goal and commitment at Wells Fargo basically is to help our global companies become more competitive in their um, industries and help them grow their international market presence by helping them basically mitigate their international payment risk. Just a little bit of history about um, us, Wells Fargo. Um, as you can see, uh, we are the fusion of two banks, Wells Fargo and, and Wachovia. Uh, Wells Fargo was founded in 1852, and the very first international presence that we had was in uh, 1900 when we opened actually about 300 offices in Mexico. And we continued in our international expansion in 1914 when we uh, went into Asia. Um, Wachovia uh, basically was one of the, as the Bank of North America was one of the first banks in the US and um, they basically started their operate, the operating international in about uh, 1890 when they started operating international um, correspondent accounts. Uh, in, it wasn't until 2008, actually, when both Wachovia and Wells Fargo did merge, when basically put Wells Fargo in, uh, in the global market and our global presence, basic presence expanded throughout the world. So uh, we talked about the past. This is, this is our present. As you can see, we are a global bank with presence in markets basically where we have knowledge that our clients have, have presence, our global clients have presence. Our intent, our commitment is basically to be in the global marketplaces where most of our clients are. Uh, we have a huge presence as, a presence, as you can see, in Hong Kong. We have more than a, a 700 uh, team members who are responsible for processing more than 10% of the trade transactions in Hong Kong. Uh, in the U.S., we have about six international operations centers. We also have satellite and in-market offices to help uh, process the trade transactions for our local clients. So our value proposition basically is to help you mitigate the international uh, payment risk by giving you tools available uh, unused by very successful global companies uh, to help you improve your international day sales outstanding uh, to help you extend your days payable uh, with your suppliers and to help you be more competitive. And by being more competitive, not only in quality services pricing, but also uh, in terms of accelerating your, your receipts of your receivables, getting your suppliers to extend your payables and therefore reducing your the price of your product, which is reducing your cost of goods sold, as well as, of course, enhancing the working capital. And we hope that, uh, that with, with these tools that we are going to be able to help you grow uh, all the trade, not only in the Americas, but throughout the world. So um, we talked about um, products. And Catherine did talk about uh, supply chain. Uh, where we are in terms of supply chain, basically the products, the trade products that will help you as an exporter or as an importer, basically, in terms of enhancing um, your payables, your receivables, and lowering your cost of goods sold. We have a few tools in our belt that obviously we'd love to share with all of you, with, uh, with importers, exporters. Um, the tools in our belt basically have to do, some of them on the upper side of the slide, 
have to do with the traditional trade finance products, which some of you may be familiar with, letters of credit, uh, collections, uh, you know, uh, just various products. And then we also have products under the supply chain finance. We have experts in market through various offices that we have here in Phoenix. And so you may be you know, able to reach to one of us here locally on the international as well as the domestic market. Um, and the key tools that we would love for you basically to, you know, to keep in your, in your toolbox uh, is having to do that as an exporter, particularly as an exporter, um, you don't have to only compete with, again, product quality, uh, with just the servicing, the customer relationships that you maintain with your buyers overseas, with pricing. Uh, we want you to be able to extend the payment terms to your buyers who basically are, are seeking just because, just like the way that we do want to reduce our pricing, they are also looking for reducing their own cost of the product that they are buying from our exporters. And so, um, and we also want you to be able to share the interest rate differentials that you as an exporter can actually uh, offer to the buyers overseas. Um, talking about interest rate differentials, this is just a, a, an indication for you to see how if you are an exporter, you can take the interest rate differential and offer it to of, offer the benefits to your buyers overseas. These are indicative um, interbank borrowing rates uh, in the various countries. So if you have a buyer in Brazil whose interbank rate is averaging 16% and you tell your buyer in Brazil that you can give them access to a borrowing rate of say three and a half, four percent per annum. Um, and you can, by doing so, you can also extend your payment terms. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a valued proposition. This is what the buyers overseas are looking for. They are looking for a relationship with the buyer here, with the exporter here, that would help them um, mitigate risks, that will help them reduce their cost of the product that you're selling to them, and that will also uh, help them buy more from you. So in short, uh, and we will keep basically giving you the same message, we want you to compete uh, in the global market, uh, but we want you to share some of the tools or use some of the tools that very successful companies are using. Um, by doing so, of course, we know that you will, grow, you, you will grow the business, you will grow your exports, and when you do grow the exports, we know that we will grow jobs, and when you do that, you are actually basically using the model that the most successful companies and countries do follow. So that is the message to, to you. Uh, seek our professional advisors on the international side of the bank to help you mitigate the risks and to help you basically share benefits of the, I think, very unique time that we are all enjoying, which is that very low interest rates that we can offer your buyers and suppliers overseas. So let's share those benefits. Thank you. We do have some time for questions, and yes, sir. Hello, hello. I had a question for Anna. I was noticing uh, UV, uh, UPS tends to advertise in some quarters that it's offering some of these type of financial services. Do you see UPS or other uh, logistics companies as a competitor in this space? Um, they may be a competitor um, at a low scale. Uh, really, who we see as our competitors are, you know, uh, other banks, large banks. Yeah, our competitors, basically, we consider our competitors uh, the Bank of Americas, the JP Morgans. Uh, however, um, in the supply chain type of products where we are helping 
our importers basically um, share the benefit of the interest rate differentials with their suppliers overseas. We are the only bank in the middle market segment, which for us, it encompasses companies from 20 up to $1 billion. Basically a program that helps the importer reduce their cost of goods sold by asking their suppliers to enhance or delay the payment that our importers have to make to the suppliers while mitigating basically the payment risk on the supplier and helping them get paid faster. So this program is not a new program. It is a program that has been available, that we have made available to the larger retailers, to the Walmarts. So we all ask and, 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 and think about a Walmart and we say, well, how is Walmart able to push their suppliers overseas, whether they are in Asia, whether they, they are in South America? What, what is it that they do that keeps the suppliers wanting to sell to Walmart and to agree with Walmart to extend their payment terms. If they had 90 days, they want 120 days. And if they had 120 days, they want 180 days. And the suppliers are willing to comply with that. Well, they are willing to comply with that because Walmart not only is asking them to extend their payment terms, but they are giving them a tool that tells the supplier, at the same time that I'm asking you to do something for me, I'm giving you something which is you can discount those receivables with Wells Fargo at this very low interest rate. So yes, I'm asking you to do something, but I am giving you access to a tool which in China, you will be paying anywhere from 14 to 20, 24% per annum, whereas I am giving you access to maybe a two, two and a half percent. Yes, sir. Uh, Eugenio, can you break down exports of goods versus services. And Anna, do you do any trade financing of services and can you give us an example? Absolutely. Um, there is no differentiation in terms of products and services, both um, on the traditional trade finance products such as letters of credit as well as on the supply chain on the program that I am referring to, there is no differentiation. Uh, on the service uh, side, you may have companies that are um, engineering companies or software developers that basically are selling their services to companies overseas where they may have a very large, a very long-term contract to provide a service and they basically are guaranteeing the, 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 or mitigating their payment risk by at times using a letter of credit. Uh, on the other hand, if they are basically buying a service from overseas, they can also mitigate that risk via a letter of credit and they can basically offer the same interest rate differential to either a buyer or supplier. So no differentiation between products and services. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. Eugenio? Um, I, I, I don't have it here. I think that they can be done, uh, that those series, at least for some countries, are available. Uh, my guess, and I am going to go on a limb, uh, is very, very little services. Uh, it's mostly goods. Uh, there are some exceptions. Brazil has a very large industry, uh, the petroleum industry. They are very large uh, uh, sellers of technological uh, deep water, uh, uh, petroleum production or exploration. Uh, so they might have a very large, or uh, compared to the rest of the Latin American countries, uh, component of services in their, in their exports of, of services. But uh, yeah, I think that it can be done, but it's, it's probably very, very, very small for the Latin American countries at least. For, for the US, we know that it's very, very large. I think we may have time for one more. I do, I think we should answer the question of our panel. Um, can trade continue to drive growth in the Americas? Mm -hmm. A lot of what you've talked about are, has been backward looking. Yep. Could you want to talk about the future? Yeah, I, th I think that trade can. I mean, all the, all the infrastructure and all, all the, the potential to expand trade continues to be there. Uh, of course, the trade depends on, on other countries' income. Correct, exports depend on somebody else's income. So if the, if the rest of the world continues 
start to grow and helps uh, exporters, uh, I think that uh, trade is going to continue to, uh, to uh, be a positive component of growth uh, for the Americas. Okay, especially for those companies that don't export to Argentina. <laughs> especially. Is what. Ana, would you like to contribute, or what, what's your view about the f looking forward? Clearly a lot of that for you depends on whether companies embrace internationalization and exporting. What's your sense of how uh, companies here in the U.S. and the ones you touch are, are embracing it or not? I think that, um, I think that provided that, um, uh, you know, we continue to be competitive and, um, and really offering our, our buyers overseas means of um, lower cost of financing as well as our U.S. dollars, you know. Um, you know, we are, we are enjoying that as well. It's, it's cheaper for basically buyers overseas to buy our products because of our U.S. dollar value. So if we keep that up, I think that definitely trade will continue to drive in the Americas and throughout the world. Uh, join me in thanking Eugenio and Anna. Thank you, Doug. Boy, what an excellent panel. Uh, let's, let's thank them again. It's, it's uh, it, having been on them myself, it's very tough to be the last panel and to do such a distinguished job with some important, very important content and insights as we've heard. Um, well, um, that really brings us to the end of today's program. I want to thank you all for being here. Again, I want to thank all our partners and our sponsors. Um, and uh, I want to relay this to you. So um, the GIC surveys its folks who attend its programs and folks who participate in its programs, and we look at the information. And, you know, people keep coming back to our programs, and we ask the question, why is that? And it's a real simple answer, regardless who's answering it, whether it's um, someone from a community college who's here today, and there's a gentleman here today from community college, and we applaud you for being here, or whether it's the president of Federal Reserve Bank. They say it's because they learned something, and they learned something in a non-biased, objective platform. So we hope today we've delivered some information to you which will be valuable, and we thank you. Thank you very much, and good evening. <laughs>